Okay, good morning. Our last lecture today. So, um, yeah, it's been kind of an interesting experience. I think the most uh, important thing was that we um, managed to uh, re we managed to reinvent ourselves through these Zoom meetings. This was quite a curveball that we were thrown, and um, you know, still being able to respond to that. That was, I think, uh, quite good. And I must say, you know, all of you have, have to take a lot of credit for that, for adjusting to this new way of uh, learning. Okay, so what I want to do today, I have a bunch of things uh, that I've planned. Um, the, I want to dwell a little more on the main ideas that we were starting to talk about. So, Hi, Nishchal. Hi, Changyan. Uh, so we talked about uh, a few key ideas I would absolutely like you to take away, and those have to do with the Landau paradigm. And we talked about that. Essentially, the key element there is an understanding of the symmetry of your Hamiltonian. Uh, and um, Understanding the, the symmetry allows one to write down uh, some kind of a either model or, Hamil or field theory or effective theory in terms of that symmetry. And then there's a control parameter in that, uh, in the uh, coming through the temperature, if it's a classical field theory. And if it's a quantum field theory, again, one can write an effective theory now in space and time. Why does time come in? Because whenever you have a quantum problem, the statics and dynamics cannot be delinked. Uh, in a classical problem, they can be delinked. For example, if you have an Ising model, you can decide to put any kind of dynamics. Uh, a dynamics which just involves a spin flip, that would be something that doesn't conserve spin its dynamical behavior will be completely different from a dynamics where you are saying uh, you flip, a, you do like a two spin flip. That would conserve the total, uh, that would conserve SZ total. So depending on the kind of conservation laws, you can have different kinds of dynamics in, uh, in a classical system. But in a quantum system, you don't have that freedom. Because once you have the Hamiltonian, the wave function evolution is determined. Psi of t is e to the i h t psi acting on psi zero. That unitary operator determines the dynamics. So in the field theory, you will get, in the effective field theory, you will get fluctuations in space as well as fluctuations in time. We write it as imaginary time to make it look like statistical physics. But e either way, there's a space and time exponent. And uh, this, okay, so that's one important thing, the importance of field theories. Okay, so um, I want to stress this a little more. You start with some elementary degrees like spins, but you can coarse grain to fields, like our magnetization fields. And this allowed us to study not just a uniform system, but inhomogeneous systems. And that's what allowed us to look at fluctuations. And the key point there were the spatial fluctuations were captured by a correlation length that, uh, that uh, became divergent. And in a quantum problem, you have a, a divergent time. And these two exponents then pretty much uh, the exponent nu and the exponent z. Exponent z tells you how time and space are related, then pretty much describe the criticality. Okay, so going along that, what I want to do today is go back to where we left off last time. And that was, um, you guys were going to tell me about the superfluid, um, Den, uh, stiffness and um, how that behaves uh, near a quantum transition. So let's see, I'm looking, um, only two people, uh, unless I missed it, but I only saw 
two people responding to that. Am I right? Or have people sent responses somewhere where I can't see them? You know where you want the, wanted the response, and so I just emailed it to you. You did email it to me. That's what um, also Gabe did, but I didn't get any. I was hoping you guys would just respond on um, um, you know, the, e the box folder, or not box, I mean uh, the email, or rather canvas mail. But that's fine. Let's just continue talking. So let me pose the question. Let's discuss it a bit. And then the main thing I want to show you is how we develop an effective theory for this problem. Okay, so that's kind of the theme. So let me see. I, Gabe, I see you are there. And uh, Brad, so you are the two who responded. So I'll let you talk just a bit. Let me make sure I pose the question. So, um, people know what I'm talking about. What's our... Okay, so here's uh, what we are talking about. We have been studying, so rather interestingly, we went from studying Ising, so that was SZ kind of Ising model. Then we went to studying um, O2, and then we went to Heisenberg, O3. These were classical. Then from here, we so this was one route. Then to SZ, we added H, uh, X, let's say. Uh, SX. So this was now the quantum direction. Right, and this one basically gave us the transverse field Ising model. We then see that the transverse field Ising model in 1D is like a 1 plus 1D model quantum mo a classical model, one plus one D. So it's essentially like a 2D uh, model and it can have uh, some of the features of, uh, of two-dimensional classical critical phenomena. Okay, um, and from spins, so then from O3, we kind of went to the Bose-Hubbard model. We identified bosons as, um, um, hardcore bosons, but then we generalized it to softcore bosons. And this is where we were. This has been our playing ground. So from Bose-Hubbard model, we essentially found this phase diagram. I'm not bothering to write the model. You, have you guys heard the lecture on the criticality of the Bose-Hubbard model? How many yeah. of you have heard that? or not heard that. Can I have a show of hands here? How many of you did not hear the lecture so far on the criticality of the Bose-Hubbard model? Can I see any hands that didn't hear? Okay, no, everybody heard it, okay. Because um, we have seen um, in one model, we have seen two kinds of criticality, which is also a very interesting example. So I've tried because I've tried to pick a kind of um, quintessential examples through which I can explain a few concepts. So let's uh, uh, review that because today is kind of a last review class. So for the transverse fieldizing model, let's try to draw now the phase diagram in the temperature H, uh, X over J plane, right? We mainly in the class discussed the zero temperature behavior and we saw there were two phases. This, the phase at zero temperature has long range order. This has long range order because it's pretty much like a 2D Ising model. 
right? So that has long range order in the Ising universality class. So let's call it 2D Ising universality class. I'm doing the one plus. You can study the transverse field Ising model in any dimension, by the way, but we are doing it in one plus one here. Okay, now this system had a gap and that gap basically went to zero at, at this critical point. At any finite temperature, this system does not have long range order because it becomes a 1D Ising model. It's only when the temperature is zero does it become a 2D uh, Ising model, okay? I want to be sure that that is clear because you, know, you have this beta direction. This is X and this is tau and the extent uh, in the tau direction is beta, which is um, one over the temperature. So <clears throat> in the thermodynamic limit, X is infinite, if your tau direction is finite, at some point the system realizes that correlations can't grow <clears throat> beyond that system size and it starts looking effectively 1D. So it becomes, uh, there's no order at any finite temperature. So let's write that down, no order for T not equal to zero. But there is a gap and the gap goes to zero. So let's call that some delta gap. On the large H side, you again, all your spins are now pointing in the X direction. And again, there is a gap to a spin flip. And that gap, this other side also has a gap. So let's just call it delta tilde gap. And then this quant quantum critical point then controls all of these fluctuations in this kind of gapless region. So the key point about the quantum critical point is that it, it's a gapless. You know, the excitations around it are gapless. And that's what you see in this extended region, you have gapless excitation. So this is all gapless. And they are controlled by the quantum, quantum critical. Okay, so this uh, other part here also does not have order. So no order, okay. This has long range order. This is quantum paramagnet here on this line. And it's basically a classical paramagnet. So that's the story with the one plus one D uh, um, transverse field model. Um, it's a little, it's quite different for the Bose Hubbard model that we talked about. And what's the main difference? The main difference is at least when we were talking about it in um, um, in um, the general case, you had a super the the phase the low um, field. Uh, phase is replaced by a state that has long range order, phase order. So let's draw that. So this would be like a summary uh, thing to, for today. So I have zero, I have temperature here and I have, let's um, not fixate too much on the lobes and all of that, but let's just say I have, I'm studying a superfluid with some interactions. Here is u over t. This is a zero u. So I, um, I should pick some dimension here. Let's be very simple here. Let's just take d equal to three for a minute. Uh, so it's three dimensions, zero u, the system is a superfluid, right? And it has some Tc. As we increase u, um, now come this, uh, this issue of, uh, so at, at zero U, uh, you have long range phase order, which is getting lost due to thermal fluctuations. As you increase U, TC comes down. 
vanishes. And so this phase indeed has, it's a superfluid and it has off diagonal long range order everywhere. Um, and then beyond that, on the other side, it's a mott. Um, let's say this side, it is mott insulator and it has a gap. So there's a delta gap. Okay. Now, this is a little more complicated because previously there was no criticality at finite temperatures, right? There was no order anyway, but there was a gap scale. You cross the gap scale and then you got into the gapless regime. That was the case with the transverse field Ising model. Here, you are indeed in an ordered phase. This phase has long range order. And by now you understand what kind of long range order it is. Uh, it, it's essentially your, you have long range phase order. And, but beyond that, you go into a gapless phase. So again, the key thing here is that we are going into a gapless phase. And this is now quantum critical. Okay, I want to make, bring out one subtlety here. You have to analyze the fluctuations around this critical point. And what you will see is there are these, a small region which is controlled by the Ginzburg criterion that we worked out in class. So there's a small Ginzburg region which tells us how big are the fluctuations. The thermal, these are the, critical fluctuation. So this region that I'm plotting here is basically a region which has classical critical fluctuations. And this would be in, if it's a 3D system, it's in the 3D XY universality class. Okay. Around, but there's a much larger gapless region here, which is controlled by this critical point, and its exponents will be in the D plus Z universality class. I'll show you some simulation results that I have uh, from my own work to explain this, this triangular region. But the main thing you can see is that there is a big gapless region which will be controlled by this quantum critical point. Now, you know, does it go on forever? The answer is no, there is some short cutoff, short distance cutoff at, on this temperature scale. Okay, good. Any questions on this? This is like a recap. So broadly at this point, I have recapped the entire course through the Landau paradigm, through, F so key ideas, Landau paradigm, effective field theories, effective field theories expanded into quantum field theories. And uh, then um, uh, through these few examples, if you keep them in mind, uh, the driving uh, idea is the divergence of length scales and time scales. And with that, you can explain universality and scaling. So the most, yeah. Oh, can I ask a question? Yeah, please. So um, when you're talking about these uh, quantum models at finite temperature, are you doing the trace just by including every possible eigenstate of the Hamiltonian? Like for example, in the classical case, we would have the partition function and we'd sum over every possible configuration. But like when we were at zero T, we were just tracing over the ground state. So I'm trying to see where those two. Okay, are. yeah, let me explain that. So it depends on how you are setting it up. So the first thing is, let's say if you're, if it, you're looking at a classical problem, then we wrote Z was trace over all configurations of um, E to the minus beta H and H depends on each of these configurations, right? <clears throat> now, 
Now, when you come to quantum, and let's, so when you come to quantum, the first thing that happens is your space, you add another dimension to it. There's a time dimension. And so what you now have to trace over is, so your field becomes, if, if I use the same notation, and sometimes we go from sigma to phi, but let me not do that, other, the, other, you may get confused. You now have a sigma i at each tau, okay? So what you have done is expanded your, your space of variables. And now at each, so you basically you can make a lattice, just like previously you may have had a d-dimensional lattice. Now you have a d plus one dimensional lattice and at each point you have a Ising variable, sigma i of tau, okay? So what you have to do now is literally uh, trace over all of these configurations in space and time weighted by your action. So you can write down your uh, partition function as, I'll write it either as sigma i tau, you can write it, so you can write it as some um, sum over, if you want to use the same notation, sum over sigma i of tau, e to the minus some action s of sigma i of tau. Okay, and this action is something you have to derive by putting these discrete time steps and so on, as we did for the transverse fieldizing model. But that's the kind of problem. So you have to get the action. And so I will show you this in, a, in an example. Okay, okay so let's um, look so at that. Can I ask a question? Yes, please. So why do you use minus x? Do, do you use imaginary time here? Yeah, I'm using Im imaginary time. Okay. You know, in the end, you can go back to real time by doing what is called analytic continuation. So if people have done some diagrams, you might have done something called Matsubara sums. Uh, and that's basically you take tau, and you can Fourier transform that and go to omega n, which are basically the frequencies in imaginary time that are discrete. And then you can go to, uh, omega n can go to omega plus i delta. You can do, this is called analytic continuation. What it allows you to do is, is, is a rotation, is a weak, rot what, a weak rotation from imaginary time to real time by doing this. Um, so that's how you can get the real time dynamics. You can get your susceptibilities in, broadly you can get your susceptibilities in R and tau. And then from here, you can ultimately get chi of Fourier transform in R, you can get Q and omega. And that's really what you want the dynamical susceptibility to finally compare with some experiment. Okay. Okay, let me now- Maybe, Excuse me. Uh, yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. You just said that the classical, the classical dynamics is not determined by the Hamiltonian. Yeah. But it's in classical mechanics, it seems that all we are, we are studying is how the how to use the Hamiltonian to to calculate the dynamics. So what? Uh, what I'm saying is, for the same Hamiltonian, you can give it different dynamics. You can, you know, there are different classes of dynamics. Uh, it's not like depending on some details, but it depends on what are the conservation laws that you impose on the on the Hamiltonian. Like, given a Hamiltonian, I could decide to do either spin flip dynamics, which doesn't conserve spin as I was explaining, or you can do some other kind of dynamics which conserve spin. So mm -hmm. that is not, uh, that, is, that is controlled by uh, the type of conservation laws you, you 
that are conserved in your, so you need more than just the Hamiltonian. You also need to know what are your conservation laws. But that freedom is not there. Okay, let's discuss this later. I will be happy to discuss it. Okay, so what I want to do next is come back to this question of the effective theory for the uh, Bose model that we were talking about. And spe specifically, I want to pay attention to the phase degree of freedom. Because what we realized that we wrote the model, so we wrote the model in terms of two objects, uh, basically in terms of the uh, Bose operators, right? So our Hamiltonian was written as uh, something like um, minus T BI dagger BJ plus the Hermitian conjugate. And then there was a U term. I'm not being too picky about uh, a, a single body term and so on. So like we had these two terms. And what we realized um, that sitting in this B in the order parameter, uh, this had some real part and some angle. And this had to be viewed in a coarse grained way. We had to take our system and we had to break it up into these little um, regions, uh, these little cells. And within us, so first of all, you can't define, so in this cell, you could have number fluctuations which allowed us to define some theta. And if I now look at bi dagger bj, this can be written approximately as square, as sorry, n0 e to the i theta i minus theta j. So that is not to say that your condensate amplitude has to be identical in different cells. Right? The condensate can also be fluctuating, but that's not the most um, crit important fluctuations. The most important ones are the phase, phases whose coherence or incoherence will lead to the transitions. So that's why we now take, we are now coarse graining and trying to write an effective theory in terms of the phases. Okay, and at the back of our mind, we want to understand this kind of uh, question that we left off with last time. And that question is the following. Suppose the temperature is zero and I am looking at uh, the stiffness. So the stiffness as we, uh, dis uh, as we discussed last time was there's some, if you take some, uh, in it, take the ground state, all the spins are up, let's say, at t equal to zero. So this is the case at t equal to zero, and let's say u equal to zero, right? And now I want to figure out how, what is, their, what is the strength of the effective coupling between them? That is what is captured by delta E, which is proportional to, which goes like half rho s grad theta square. So rho s is a measure of some effective coupling between phases. You can call it an effective Josephson coupling if you come from some superconducting background. Effective, let me use the word Josephson. Josephson didn't do it in this context, but it's relevant. Okay, so that's rho s. And what I'm saying here is that this rho s starts out at one, or you can say at rho, the total density when u is zero. 
I'm always going to keep temperature equal to zero now. But as you increase u, at some point, this quantity becomes zero and indicates that you have entered a MOT state. So this is the superfluid. Here is MOT. OK, so the question I want to discuss is, with this kind of a picture now in mind, how do you understand why is rho s decreasing? So, um, Brad, uh, do you want to start first? Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, is the question that rho, uh, uh, why is rho is decreasing with u or with t? With u. Uh, with oh, t. so it doesn't matter. Either u, so the dimensionless, by t you mean temperature? Yeah. No, temperature I'm setting to be zero. Okay. So, so the question is why, why rho s decreases? Yeah. Why does rho s decrease? with uh, increasing interactions. And uh, I want to distinguish, it's not the condensate fraction. This is the response function. So we understand the condensate fraction will get, um, uh, will get um, depleted. Um, but you know, even in helium-4, uh, which has very strong interactions, the superfluid density at zero temperature is indeed one. A uh, row. Okay, so here uh, I should make one statement. So then uh, I want to say that we are near a quantum, uh, near a MOT insulator. So we are looking at a problem where we have this kind of a MOT lobe. So this is a mu over u, and this is t over u. And I'm cutting it somewhere, let's say. Uh, sorry, yeah, that's right. I'm cutting it. Uh, on some uh, axis like this. So I'm keeping mu over u fixed and I'm tuning u over t. I just plotted it in another way here. Is, that, is the problem clear now? So here I'm in a superfluid, here I'm in the MOT state and the temperature is zero. So the question is, how does the proximity of the MOT state cause superfluid density to start decreasing uh, and finally vanishing at a critical value of the interactions in this way? Okay, so yeah, so again, um, Maybe uh, if people want to say something uh, about what their thoughts are, if you thought about it. So in my response, I talked about the correlation length of the creation yes. and annihilation operators, but is rho somehow related to a, a length? Okay, very good. Let's write this down. So this is important, correlation length. And then how does rho, so that's what we want to understand. How is rho, rho s, how is it related to this c? Um, Gabe, you also sent a response. Do you want to give some idea? Um, so my response, I was just focused on thinking of this thing just in terms of the phase order overall, like within, say, those little mac uh, macroscopic subsystems. And basically saying, okay, as you increase these interactions, you're going to go from your theory where sort of the, the eigenstates are all these uh, well-ordered phases to something where you're going to mix in a bunch of you're going to mix between states where this, the, the, the order parameter is pointing in all sorts of different directions. And so as you increase the interaction strength, you're going to destroy that well-ordered phase and you're going to start to form macro, the, the macro subsystems that have phase pointing in all sorts of different directions. 
and then basically the the length scale is how big of an area is covered by these spins that are not pointing in a coherent direction. Right. So that pretty much captures this uh, transition. So let me make the picture that uh, Gabe just described. So our focus has now gone to thinking about the phase degree and we made those sub volumes. So the point is you have to think of what the MOT phase is doing to the superfluid phase. Remember how we analyzed the Ising model. Everything was up. And then we had a few puddles which were down. Now that everything is up is the statement about all the phases of the superfluid are pointing in the same direction. So you can still say everything is up. What is MOT doing? MOT basically fixes the density. That's what the MOT insulator likes to do. It is an eigenstate of the number operator. So it fixes the density. The moment it fixes the density, that point becomes a nucleus for a phase fluctuation. Because we wrote down these, um, these, uh, thing, uh, these states. Uh, if you have a state with a fixed number of particles, psi n, this is a linear combination of e to the i n theta of some psi tilde theta. You can think of it like this. That you are mixing in many phases to create a fixed number state and vice versa. You know? So what you are seeing is a, a commutator between the number operator and the phase operator. You can think of it this way. Like uh, the conjugate variables. So the picture is like what um, Gabe was describing uh, and the correlation length Brad brought up will come up now. It, uh, once again, we will think of a connected correlation. So again, in the superfluid, uh, you have basically everything is coherent, so everything is up. Now you're starting to increase U and what that will do is there will be some sites which will become like these uh, you can think of like a, a site where you have a lot of phase fluctuation at that site. So what that will do is kind of break up your system into, you know, sort of regions where you have all up, something here, you know, all those broken symmetry possible states that were ar allowed, not just up and down. This is an O2 symmetry. So what you can get, let's say, is something like this. Um, MOT uh, site could nucleate a vortex, literally. And you could get regions. So let's say I get like three regions like that. Um, I'm not drawing it too well. So what you could get is, let's say you could get puddles like this. And this superfluid is in this phase. Here it's something different, something like this. And in between, you have like a little, uh, place where your number is, this is of course all homogeneous, but you can get fluctuations. That's the point. You can get fluctuations where your number is getting fixed. That causes phase fluctuations and your big puddles become uh, super fluid on some scale. So uh, basically that coherence length is uh, going to tell you about um, the, the region of these phase fluctuations. So that's, so your phase fluctuations will grow as you come toward the transition. And then when you finally come to the MOT state, uh, then everything is fluctuating. You get these puddles, you know, then their sizes have become smaller because you are getting more and more phase fluctuations. So their sizes have become smaller and these are all, it's become like a paramagnet. So that's the MOT. So is the MOT state basically just a bunch of like macroscopic vortices? Yes. So you can, so another way people talk about it, which you may or may not find useful on the last day of the class, is that they describe the MOT state as a superfluid of vortices. 
and there's a duality. So I won't go into that too much, but um, there, there are some mappings, approximate mappings. Unlike the Ising model where you have uh, exact uh, dualities, here these are approximate dualities. Is this like the duality in the Ising model where you can describe it in terms of domain walls? Yeah. That are just dual to the original system? Yes, yes. And here it's the vortices. Okay. Okay. So what we are seeing is now an evolution from a model that we wrote down at each site with these B operators. You can basically get like an effective model for this problem, which you can, which is analogous to a Josephson junction array. And that word is not so important. I'm just putting it in case people have seen it. But basically, it's a model. It's a quantum XY model. That's what it is. And that model looks like there is some coupling, let's say minus J cosine theta I minus theta J. And where did I get that? I get that by taking my Bose operators here, writing them in terms of theta, ignoring the amplitude fluctuations. Okay, so that's what I mean by effective. Some degrees have been thrown out, but that's because those degrees may be varying a bit, but they are not important to describe the criticality. So what you get is this combination of T and N0, you can call that some J, uh, e to the i theta i minus theta j plus the con Hermitian conjugate gives you a cosine theta i minus theta j, and you have this n squared term. So you get something like this, summed over i j, and then the u term, which is sometimes also called e c, like a charging energy. So this may be called e j. So that's the Josephson energy, and this is also called the charging energy. It's a reflection of the, uh, the size of your puddles. Uh, it's like how much energy cost, it's like a Coulomb. Here we don't have Coulomb, but it's the number of uh, bosons you're putting at a site times Ni square. Okay, so this now becomes the model to think about criticality. So what I'm bringing up is the following. We looked at the Bose-Hubbard model. We did mean field theory and rather, and we did a very interesting mean field theory, you know, as we discussed in class at length, we did not do the mean field theory on the usual density term, but we did it on the, these Bose operators. And even though it looks quadratic, that is where I want to bring up the point that insight is needed before you do algebra. Uh, and it's that insight that you're looking for BEC, uh, Bose condensation that, uh, that pushed people to do the mean field theory on this operator and give that an expectation value. But even though we got this beautiful lobe structure, it completely missed the physics. Because what did we find in the mean field theory? We found that the order parameter, so this is what the mean field theory gave. It got that the B dagger expectation of B or B dagger expectation value as a function of whatever you were tuning, let's say U over T went to zero. This is now in mean field theory. But how did it push it to zero? It pushed it to zero basically with N zero was going to zero. The phase in this region was all aligned. The phase in the insulator was all aligned. So mean field theory tells you that um, you can get two phases, a superfluid phase which has a condensate N zero and a MOT phase which has zero condensate, but it misses the whole point of that uh, transition and that is that it's not the amplitude which drives the criticality. It's the phase fluctuations. So since it doesn't have phase fluctuations, it cannot get that physics, okay? So we learn something from that. We learn about these mott lobes and all that, but then you have to go to the fluctuations to understand that 
the real behavior. And you can do that at um, the level of say numerical simulations. You can get uh, what the fluctuations are doing. And I showed you Monte Carlo results, which basically showed that the MOT regions expanded and so on. But you can even do better than that by now capturing the physics. You see now in, when you do Monte Carlo, you always lose, uh, lose out in the size of the system you can work with. So um, ultimately, you know, if you are describing a boson at each site and you can do, let's say, a thousand sites, okay, you can get to a certain correlation length before you will hit the system size. But if you can coarse grain, so now many sites, what I was previously calling these cells, each cell has become a site in this problem. So I, even though I used I and J, here these I and Js are coarse grained cell variables. Okay, so now suppose I write my, I do my simulation on this model and I'm still doing a thousand sites, but I'm describing a much bigger system because I have coarse grain. Okay, so that's the power of doing effective theories. Okay, so next I'm going to take some questions here because next what I'm going to show you are some of my results and my group's results on this model and I'll show you how we can access the criticality and uh, get some universal uh, numbers there. Okay. Um, uh, I had kind of a simple question. Um, did you say that the rho sub s was not the condensate density or is it the condensate density? It's not, density? it's not. Um, I don't understand what is the difference between the condensate density and the superfluid density? Uh, these are, so it, a good way to understand the difference, take the Ising model and you can, or, or take some magnetic model and you can look at the local magnetization, right? Yes. You can look at the magnetization. That would be like the condensate density. Okay. okay. Or you can look at the susceptibility, which is a response function. And that would be like the superfluid density. Do, if, you, if the word density confuses you, just use superfluid stiffness because that will conjure up the picture of, you know, doing something globally by twisting or similar to a correlation function and so on. So think of a stiffness where you kind of do some perturbation at a boundary and look at a response and a, the condensate is uh, like a local order parameter, like this B dagger locally. I see. Okay. Thank and you. you know, whenever I get confused, I always go to helium. And helium is a very good example where uh, the condensate fraction is only 10% because uh, the interactions have pushed elect uh, the bosons out of the zero momentum state. So that's a bit like say, you're targeting the N0, the amplitude of your order parameter. And the superfluid stiffness is targeting the phase of the order parameter and really the long range phase coherence. So uh, from, from your uh, uh, effective field theory where you wrote half rho is del theta squared, it, it seems to me like it's some sort of a torsional spring yeah. between the yeah. effective spins that we are calling, which are basically just bosons represented as arrows, right? Uh, so um, uh, so uh, I, there was some talk about a commutator between n and theta. So can, I don't really understand. So, so n is coming from a bosonic picture, like it's, it's looking at the density. And uh, theta, theta. I, I mean, I mean, can, can you just yeah. talk about how you can find the commutator and and how is that important? Yeah. Uh, so what you have is 
you know, let's say I have two cells here. This has, let's say, it, it has, so uh, let's say what you have in EJ, so the, let's say it has some phase here, right? And say they were far, far away. One had a phase there, another had a phase there. Now you start bringing them close by. So when they were far away, they had their own individual phases. When you start bringing them closer, they would like to align. How does, how does that happen? How do they start aligning? There must be some talk between the two. Yeah. What is that talk? That talk is basically bosons hopping from here to there. Okay. Oh, okay. So okay. only when bosons hop from one cell to another, mm -hmm. and what does boson hopping do? It changes the number of bosons on a site. Okay. Yeah. So the system is fighting between these two tendencies. If the number gets fixed, the phase becomes uncertain. Yeah. By bosons hopping, the phases will align. Okay, so, so this, this rho, rho S is, 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 is kind of like a hopping term for, for yes. bosons. Yes. And, and the U, U wants to lock everything down. And, yes. Uh, in, okay. Yes, exactly. And uh, basically, the, the reason, coming back to this uh, one very quick thing, this question of why is rho S decreasing, now that you said it uh, very nicely, that it's like the effective hopping, you see, if the phases on what, what, the, what U is doing, it's starting to fluctuate the phases on each of these puddles. So if a boson is trying to hop, it's not able to hop coherently. That's one way to say it. Another way to say it is if you're applying an external twist, right, that costs some energy. But if your system is already fluctuating because of these quantum fluctuations, that cost in energy is not that large. So rho S goes down. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. Okay, great. Um, let me uh, show you some, um, some uh, things. I think you'll, you'll find this very informative. Um, let me, yeah, and I have a couple of uh, pieces to show you here. Okay. So, can you see my screen? Can you yes. see my screen? Okay. So, this was a beautiful experiment where, you know, so this question had come up in our class one time. If your order parameter is complex, right, how do you see that? Uh, and especially when I say that it has picked one of the directions. So in a given condensate, the phase is really not meaningful, right? Because the system will pick one value for the phase, Let, and you can even call that phase zero. So there's no question of measuring the phase of a particular condensate, one condensate. But the best thing is if you bring two condensates, each one will have their own phase. And if they start overlapping, it's like taking two light beams with a fixed phase and interfering them. And that's what this picture shows. So this is, uh, this is made with cold atoms um, and you take them in a trap. So you can either take uh, one condensate in a trap and then do a two slit experiment where you break it up into two condensates and make them interfere. Or here they have even taken two separate condensates, each with their own phase. And the phase difference shows up now when you get the matter waves uh, interfering. So that's really beautiful. You know, it's like a coherent beam of 
matter wave, like a coherent beam of photons, which we would call a laser. This is what we would call like a matter laser. Yeah. So I thought this is, uh, this is something you should see because uh, this is um, like a prelude to the other data I had shown you the other day where there, was an op there were these uh, coherent atoms in, a, in an optical lattice. So that's like the next version beyond this. Okay, so this is uh, one thing. And the other way you can see the phase of the order parameter is uh, through vortices that we have talked about in a model, but you can also create them in a lab. And uh, in a superconductor, you, I'm not going to go into that, but the difference is they have charge. So through the Lorentz force, uh, you can couple to the magnetic field. The analog of that for a neutral superfluid is the Coriolis force, where you have a rotation and that couples to the mass times velocity. So that's coming from the Coriolis force. Uh, when you go into the rotating frame, you can uh, get a very similar coupling. And what that does is that in the superfluid, if you rotate it, the system doesn't just become normal beyond some critical rotation, it actually inserts vortices uh, that uh, pick up so the point is that the superfluid is irrotational. It does not rotate. It has no inertia. So there's no way for the mass to couple to the rotation. But as you put in vortices, the core of the vortex carries angular momentum. And so that uh, angular momentum that you are putting in externally is going to pierce the system through these vortices and ultimately, the, you will add enough vortices to, uh, the, to equal what you are putting in from the external, um, external uh, rotation. So that's in helium. And this is a more recent experiment. Uh, you can see it's only 2000, where they managed to rotate a BEC uh, by using something called a laser spoon. So you take two lasers. And then, you know, literally like a spoon, you rotate it. You rotate the laser beams and that imparts angular momentum into the BEC. Now going into how it all happens is a lot of detail, but I just wanted to show you these uh, data here. Um, yeah. Um, any questions? Actually, at this point, I don't think I can really uh, get into these cold atoms. I'm not going to take uh, too many questions there. But what I do want to do is, so I, okay, maybe I can take any questions on understanding now the phase degree, which we pretty much completed. Either we do it through interference or through creating vortices. These vortices are quantized, unlike classical vortices. So each one will carry an angular momentum, um, which is like a flux quantum analog. Okay. So the last thing I wanted to show you was a little bit uh, carrying on on this effective field theory. So let me show you some slides from uh, Uh, has it stopped sharing? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, let me see if I can go to this. So what I want to show you are some results for the quantum XY model, okay? Especially going toward the critical point because that's where we would like to get some idea about the how we handle both temperature and the tuning parameter. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, so do you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, okay so this is that uh, quantum XY model, right? And um, now when you write it as, a, as an effective field theory, so what you do is you take this model, write it as e to the minus beta h, and I would have loved to do this calculation in class. We ran out of time a little bit, but it, the procedure is very much like the transverse fieldizing model. Uh, so what you get now is uh, an action, or you can call it a Hamiltonian in this d plus one dimensional uh, xy model. Okay, so what we have, let's just look at it on, I get a lattice at each site, I would have my variable phi, which can point in any direction, right? It's an O2 degree of freedom at each lattice site and time point. Okay, now the um, Hamiltonian has two coupling constants. Um, actually, I should have put the betas in there. Uh, let me see if I have a table. I Okay, I should have put the temperatures back in the couplings. Okay, never mind. Uh, but you get now effective couplings between phases on two nearby sites. Let me call that K0. And you also get couplings between phases on the same site, but at two time steps. So this is the kind of anisotropic XY model you will get. And the original coupling constants, EC and EJ, get related to these uh, uh, couplings uh, K0 and K tau. Okay, so let me try to uh, give you an idea. So K0 is, of course, going to be proportional to EJ. It's actually beta times EJ. The other one is not proportional to EC, but 1 over EC. And I'm not going to be able to say why, but it just comes from doing some Gaussian integrals and you get a denom you get a, in completing the squares, you get this one over EC. But let me physically explain why. So what you see is when, um, you know, in the time direction, if EC is large, right? one over EC will be small, which means the coupling will be small, and therefore the phases will fluctuate. And that's, what, that's the effect you want, because when EC is large, it's trying to define the number of bosons at a site, which means it's causing, it's more conducive to phase fluctuations in the time direction, right? And so that's, that's how you get an inverse behavior in the time direction. So large EC means a small coupling, whereby you will get large fluctuations in the time direction. So the, now the picture becomes very clear for the quantum fluctuation. When you are in a moth state, your bosons like to, the number of bosons is not fluctuating, which means the phases are fluctuating. So in a moth state, these phases will be all over the map. In a superfluid phase, the phases will be aligned both spatially and in the time direction because EC is small, which means K tau is large. Okay. Is that a kind of clear? Because now what I'm going to do is look at the stiffness that we have been talking about as a function of EC divided by EJ. So you can okay. calculate the stiffness uh, from some velocity correlators. Okay, I'm not going to go into that. So I'm skipping a few things. I just want to show enough for our class. So just focus on this one. This is basically the uh, this is basically a susceptibility, which is related to the spectral function to the stiffness, and it shows that 
when you are, so the Y axis here uh, is what I'm doing here with each cut is I'm increasing EC over EJ. And this is a plot of that superfluid stiffness. It's a susceptibility. So there's some omega dependence. And what you see is that in the superfluid, you get a delta function at omega equal to zero. So it's gapless. But when you go, so that, that's a measure of trying to insert a boson into the system. Since the number is fluctuating, it's very easy to insert a boson into a superfluid, right? There's no constraint. And that's why you get this sharp red peak. The moment you enter the moth state, the peak splits, giving you a gap. And that then denotes the superfluid to moth transition, okay? So this is like really state of the art results on this quantum XY model that uh, one of my students got a couple of years back. Okay, I will skip some of these and uh, then again show you that you can buy, you know, you have to do when you do numerics, you have to do kind of careful numerics to show that, um, you know, you may find that superfluid density goes to zero at some point as a function of some tuning parameter and your gap from the other side goes to zero at a different point. You know, I show these nice things where everything crashes at the same point, but numerically that may not happen. And you may have to do very careful um, scaling of the temperature. So you, you remember I was saying that only when the uh, beta is infinite, do you get the quantum critical point but the question is, how do you ever get to that infinite numerically? And this is how you do it. If you have 64 time slices, you see that as a function of your EC over EJ or whatever your tuning parameter is, you will see the superfluid density goes, going to zero on one side, the gap going to zero on another side, but then there is some window. And you can, you can scrunch that window up by taking longer and longer time slices. And so you'll get a whole set of points and by extrapolating those points, you can find that single quantum critical point. Okay, this is a very important uh, part because this then helps us identify the quantum critical region. Actually that region one should be a little more subtle here by removing some of the classical critical region. I haven't done that but at least this gives you some idea of how to uh, pick out these, uh, this kind of physics in a finite system and through numerics. Any question? So Z nu here is uh, one which gives us the correct universality class for this problem. It turns out to be the this was a two dimensional system, third dimension is time. So it's the 3D XY model. Any questions here? So you're saying the time step is what determines the temperature for this? Uh, so, um, you know, we took the, the beta dimension and broke it up into a lattice. So there's a little time step, delta tau, right? So beta is the number of time steps, the number of slices. So let's say in the first example, it was uh, 64. Um, I think delta tau might have been something like an eighth. Okay, so that's a beta of um, eight in units of EJ. Okay, I'm not changing the delta tau. It's remaining one eighth but I'm adding more time slices. So what does that do? It makes beta larger and therefore the temperature is becoming lower. And so each of these points is obtained by taking, keeping, it's like your lattice constant is a unit. And you, in, re, in real space, you can take more and more sites and that increases your spatial dimension. Here again, my time, my uh, time step is fixed at some 
some number. But if I take more and more time slices, I, I become bigger, longer and longer in the uh, beta direction, which means lower and lower temperatures. Okay, so that's how these points are obtained. Uh, for each of these points is the temperature at which your superfluid density is going to zero. So we usually say that we just let t equal zero and see what happens. So how would we, is it possible to do anything at exactly t equal zero numerically? Or uh, we just start with the ground state? Right, so uh, that's a, a different way. So that if you, this might also be related to what Saad was asking about the wave function. So if you want to simulate, so, so first point is whenever you do a path integral, you always simulate in finite temperature and then you take temperature going to zero, like what I showed here, okay? So, but if you want to simulate at exactly zero temperature, then you basically have to uh, do what is called variational Monte Carlo. And uh, variational means you start with an initial trial state, and then there is a, something called a projector method to uh, throw away the excited states. So when I get back my um, writing pad, I will write a little bit, but that would be a way to do, you have to start with, you don't know what the many body ground state wave function is, right? That's the problem. So you have to start with a variational wave function and then filter out the excited states. And I'll explain that when I get back my iPad. So let me just make sure, but that's a good question. These kinds of sim path integral simulations are a different category. And they are very, uh, very important because you don't bias anything. Okay, that's one reason they are very nice. So these simulations that I'm doing are totally unbiased. I'm not putting in anything except for, uh, I'm getting a bit carried away. What time? I just got carried away today. I didn't keep track of time. Ah, yeah. So you're not biasing your simulation in any way. You're just uh, exactly, except for the small delta tau approximation, which also is quite controlled. You can uh, take all these limits very precisely to zero. That's why these simulations are important. The other reason is temperature is anyway a variable in any experiment. So we sometimes do want the temperature behavior. But if you just want ground state, many body ground state behavior, ultimately that's the physics of the quantum phase transition. You can do a variational Monte Carlo. Okay. Can I, I ask a quick question? Yes. Um, so I'm a little unsure about all the tools that we have to use. So in this computation, did you use any RG or anything like that? Uh, no. The RG that, uh, we didn't use RG in, this, in the way we have talked about, where you uh, find a fixed point and then you do uh, scale, you find the re renormalization group operator and then you uh, look for its uh, relevant, irrelevant directions. We didn't do it like that. But we do still do it through finite size scaling. A little bit uh, like what Changyan and um, Shoyantan talked about. When they found the susceptibility in the Ising model, they got the data collapse and the idea behind the data collapse is scaling. And that scaling yes. is uh, also used here. So again, I'll quickly show you that. Some of the things may be a little, you know, we need a little more background, unfortunately, even for, even though I told you it's the quantum XY model, um, there are still things we need uh, as background. But let, let me just quickly um, show you the scaling idea and one would have to translate it to, uh, to some of the quantities we are talking about. So for example, Let's assume I was looking at the superfluid stiffness. Here I'm looking at uh, something called the DC conductivity, but um, the superfluid stiffness is equally a quantity one could be looking at. And just like we saw in the susceptibility that you did for the Ising model, 
it, uh, we were able to scale data at many temperatures on the same plot. This is an analogous kind of scaling plot. So this would be like my uh, tuning parameter EC over EJ relative to the critical point. Are you guys able to see my screen? Yeah, uh, yep. relative to the critical point, T to the minus one over mu is what we, you know, usually what we have is the role of P minus PC is taken by T minus TC. And the role of temperature here is the field that we were trying to tune. And then we had an exponent. So there is a correspondence of all of that to now the tuning parameter being P minus PC, temperature to some exponent, which you see involves the dynamical exponent now. Okay, so once you do that, you can again get these kinds of scaling plots to collapse your data. Okay, so going into this in more detail will take some time, but the, the takeaway message is that any uh, simulation you do will have to use RG ideas to guide you in how to plot the data and do a data collapse and find your critical exponents. Okay. okay, and find your critical point and critical exponents. The critical point is easier to find. You remember there was a talk about binder ratio and binder ratio was a way to plot some moments and then there was a crossing and at the crossing, you know, you found that uh, things did not, different temperatures crossed or different fields crossed at the same point that identified the critical point. Here also, you could be looking at the superfluid stiffness versus your tuning parameter at different temperatures, and they cross at one point, um, and that gives you the critical point. So all of these ideas are at the backdrop of how you do this kind of thing. Ooh, sorry. And one last, I just wanted to show one last figure where, um, uh, a bunch of, you know, this is like, this, this is, you know, research that way is fun when you start to connect many, many different uh, techniques. And I have always been a very, um, I'm very fond of uh, non-perturbative techniques. Uh, that's why I like, um, you know, numerical techniques. But as I always say, if you just do numerics, you are never going to get insight because that is like doing an experiment without analysis. That's not to say you can't get insight from experiments, but you have to analyze it. Similarly, uh, the theory also, you have to, the simulations also, you have to analyze. And uh, it's useful sometimes to bring many techniques together and see what you get. So this is like the last thing I want to show you. Um, so can you guys see my screen with a table? Yes. Okay, uh, so, uh, you know, we talked about a superfluid phase, which has, um, in terms of like, if it was a con superconductor, this would be uh, a phase which has infinite conductivity, we have an insulator with zero conductivity. At the transition, it has a finite conductivity. And moreover, that conductivity is universal. Okay, so in the superfluid insulator, also you can translate this. And uh, the superfluid has zero viscosity. Um, and then there's a way you can convert conductivity at the transition, but the crucial point is that number is universal in some units. So here the units were E square over H. And I want to show you um, that a bunch of very different techniques. So I don't know, some of you may have heard of these holography techniques, ADS CFT. CFT means conformal field theory. ADS is anti disitter space. And so you're taking a conformal field theory, which is, um, which is what we are doing, the physics at the critical point uh, essentially becomes like a conformal field theory. 
but rather remarkably, it was shown by Maldacena, you can map these CFTs to gravity theories in one higher dimension. And uh, these CFTs appear as surface uh, theories of these uh, higher dimensional gravity theories. Okay, whatever, that stuff. Uh, people have uh, used that to find also the critical, uh, the conductivity at the transition. And you can see it rather remarkably agrees with, um, with the simulations. So, you know, both sides have something to learn because they make some assumption. We make different kinds of assumptions. And that's where none of these are exact until you have something like on Sagar, these which are few and far between, but otherwise uh, these different methods bring a lot of um, uh, useful ways to learn about things. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think I'm pretty much uh, done with what I was planning to talk about. Um, we could take some more questions or we could all say goodbye and uh, end the course. It's been, I must say, I've really enjoyed the course. I hope you guys enjoyed it too. Um, we should, we have learned also kind of in an interesting way about many different techniques. We have also talked about techniques. Um, you know, it's hard because I have to balance concepts and techniques and techniques take a long time to learn. So I've kind of weighed it a little bit more in the direction of uh, asking, uh, you know, so the central, if there's one thing I want you to take away from my course here is be curious. If you just do that, everything will open up. Second thing is, um, understand why you are calculating something before you calculate it. You know, what happens in these courses, we are so fixated on calculating that we often forget, you know, somebody tells you, calculate this, that's the problem set, and right away everybody goes and, you know, we try to calculate. We never ask why. The key thing about research is you're going to sit back and you're going to first ask why. And then you're going to form a picture of what you're going to calculate. And then you will start to calculate. And I'm bringing this up because it has come up in our course in some wonderful ways. Even mean field theory, if you didn't do the right mean field theory, you wouldn't have gotten the lobes. Even if you did the right mean field theory and stopped, you wouldn't have learned about phases. And uh, if you had stopped again at the Bose-Hubbard model, you wouldn't have learned about the effective quantum XY model. And if you had stopped again at simulations of quantum XY, you, you wouldn't have gotten deeper insights into the criticality, which can come from many directions. And so it's like a whole world starts opening up if you start delving deeper and deeper. And it even doesn't end there. So now I'm using similar ideas to understand like Josephson junctions are forming the backdrop for quantum uh, information and uh, entanglement. So it's like you, the, the last message I'll say and then I'll stop is whatever little you do, do it really well. Because if you really understand, like maybe the transverse fieldizing model, you really understand it, you have another problem thrown at you, make links with what you understand. And uh, you'll see like the kind of depth you'll get from understanding deeply is, there's a beauty in that. Okay, and that's, that's the last word from me. So I can take more questions if you want. I'm sorry, I have a question. So basically, um, for superfluid, uh, can we do something like a superconductor and like do a Joseph junction and see the flow through the like the insulator piece as yeah. well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's been my research for the last almost ten odd years. Is uh, basically uh, take superconductors, 
And uh, you know, what is really interesting is uh, there's the BCS theory of superconductivity, which was very successful. Actually, it's very limited, you know, um, because BCS theory talks about, um, again, in terms of the order parameter, the BCS theory is at the level of understanding what we have been talking about in terms of BEC at the level of the condensate. That's what BCS theory is. So BCS theory, the order parameter is some pair operator, but that pair operator is complex. In BCS theory, uh, they don't worry about the phase. So the first person to talk about the phase was Josephson. And then everything about Josephson came out and the Josephson junction and all of that. But even in a superconductor, suppose you don't have a junction, you just have one superconductor. Can you see these phase fluctuations? And the answer is yes. You have to go to superconductors which are more strongly correlated. So in the BCS superconductor, the, the size of the pairs is huge uh, compared to the distance between two, Cooper pair, uh, two electrons. So there's an inter-electron spacing and then there is the pair size. The pair size is like 10,000 times the interparticle spacing. So um, if you now come to other superconductors, which are more strongly coupled as they are called, like high TC superconductors, the pair size is just about two or three times the inter-electron spacing. Then the phase fluctuations really become important. And you can see these. Uh, so Yanjun, what was your question specifically about that? Um, yeah, I was asking like how, so for superconductor, you can measure the currents through the junction. So can you measure something similar in superfluid as well? Yeah, you can. Uh, and uh, people measure, so your question was the other way. Okay. That's right. Yeah. So, um, uh, so in uh, superfluids, you can also make junctions. You can make weak links. And uh, the, there are beautiful experiments seeing super flow through a weak link. A weak link is you take two super, con super fluids and make a small constriction between them. And now the phases on the two sides have to align and they have to go through that weak link through what is called uh, the, the gradient of the phase is now forced to fluctuate across the weak link and they can see super flow and also cut it off. Okay. Yeah. People have done some very beautiful experiments with superfluids. I see. Thank you. Uh, another very interesting thing in superfluids is you can look for something called a super solid. Um, you know, so a solid has diagonal long range order, like the density is ordered. A superfluid has. Um, um, off diagonal long range order in X and Y. The kind of state we were looking at, you know, that super, the picture I gave you with those coherence peaks, right? That would be kind of a super solid, uh, but it's not, I'll tell you, because there the lattice was explicitly put in, right? It didn't emerge. It was uh, not that you took some liquid in a container and it became a solid and it also had these coherence peaks. That lattice was superimposed externally, but people have tried to look for such a state, uh, not totally successful, where you take helium, at the lowest temperatures, helium never freezes. It doesn't become a solid because of zero point motion. You put pressure and it does become a solid. But the question is, is it a solid or does it also have a, some superfluidity, which is kind of uh, sneaking and you know, running around, but there's some density pattern as well. And uh, this has been a very open question so far. Okay, thank you. Yeah, more questions? More questions? Do you think there will be a second semester course 
Well, like, are you hoping to teach a second semester course? Oh, I'm, I would always be delighted to teach such courses if they don't plunk me into some other course. I, if you guys wrote good things about it, I might get such a course, but it, by the way, did everybody fill out the SEIs? Okay. So I think one thing you guys could request is another course. And, uh, you know, it could even be done by any of my other colleagues, you know. And it's not even just one other course. We should really be having targeting many more systematically. You know, there is a whole body of stuff to learn. Um, it's just that everybody's research becomes a bit different. That's why I feel, okay, the main aim in this, in any course should be to teach you how to teach yourselves. So, you know, you guys basically have those tools. So like going forward, the kinds of things we couldn't cover, and now I can see I was like super ambitious when I wrote my uh, list of topics, but it would really be, I would start with dualities and then go to gauge theories. That's the one, that's another direction where, you know, we looked at global, uh, sorry, we looked at, um, yeah, global uh, ordering of phases, but you can also look at local symmetries and local gauge invariants. That drives a very interesting field today. So that would be one kind of uh, course. And then I feel like methods is very powerful to know methods, but it's something that is hard to teach because, you know, you really need to work on it. Each person needs to work on it. And I have to say from my side, I was never motivated to learn a method. Till I got to a point, you know, I need an answer to this. Then it's very quick, you can learn the method. But I was never motivated to take courses which taught you, you know, this or that. And I'm like, yeah, you know, if, this, if the question is not of interest to me, why would I waste so much time? So that's why I wasn't able to bring myself to bring talking about methods here, even though I have like a huge arsenal of methods, because over the course of my career, different questions would come up. And yet I have seen that today what I'm working on, none of those methods work. So like, you know, variational Monte Carlo, path integral Monte Carlo in real space, you know, in, in uh, this... Uh, coherent space, as well with Grassmann operators. I know all of that, but do they work for the problem I need today, which is on spin liquids? No, they don't work. So, you know, that's the kind of challenge. And that's exciting because that means now I'm like ground zero. I have to like build up a whole new set of techniques for this question. So really for me, the question has been the driver. So I'm, I wasn't able to talk about techniques. But I feel through the projects each of you did, look at all the techniques we learned. We learned about transfer matrices, low temperature expansions, high temperature expansions, um, Monte Carlo, uh, RG in real space, in momentum space. So we covered like six or eight techniques through um, just the projects. So I would say that the projects have also been a very integral part of this course. And it cannot be any other way. Otherwise, you know, uh, people just can't be uh, excited about, um, about uh, a course if they are not participating in it. Yeah. But I think the thing to do is there are now three, six, uh, I think we are six theorists now. So, uh, and people can teach many types of courses. Another thing we didn't discuss here was disordered systems. You know, um, for the Bose-Hubbard model, um, Sandeep was asking about doing RG. We couldn't, we didn't have time, but um, you can do a more general RG, not just for the Bose-Hubbard, you can also include disorder. And that was the work by Fisher and um, his collaborators. So disorder is another very interesting field where you can coarse grain with, um, it's always the same kind of physics. There is something happening that is in real space you can solve. It could be the number operator, some kind of localization physics, and then something in a conjugate variable. And that drives, it could be momentum space or phase space or something. 
that's why I say if you learn one thing well, it'll just pay off everywhere. But that's another big area we didn't uh, do. But each of these are really big topics. And um, maybe seminar courses on the order of 10, 15 lectures can be a way to consolidate some of these topics. Okay, go enjoy the sun. Any last comments, any last questions? I am looking at everybody. We are still meeting on Friday, right? Oh yeah, yeah. We still have two more talks to go on Friday. And then we have that small cons uh, meeting to consolidate the quote unquote book. Okay, bye. See you. Bye. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.